Welcome to Kuwait's Industrial Automation and Control Systems Cybersecurity Conference, KIAX Cybersecurity 2014, 25 through 26 May 2014. Hosted and organized by Equate Petrochemical Company in partnership with KPC. Ladies and gentlemen, let's move on to our keynote speaker this morning. We're going to be welcoming back Eric Byers, and he's going to be um, doing a speech entitled Alternatives to Patching for More Secure and Reliable Control Systems. So please welcome back to the stage Eric Byers, Chief Technology Officer and VP of Engineering at Tofino Security. Eric, welcome. Thank you very much. It's good to be back here. Um, we've been talking a lot about incidents. I talked about incidents in my earlier talk. But incidents aren't a problem if you don't have any vulnerabilities. If there's nothing broken in your system, if there's no weaknesses, you won't have any incidents. But the reality is, is that we all end up with a lot of, incident, a lot of vulnerabilities. Our products, uh, control, um, computer systems, computer products, whether it's your iPhone or your your software or your computer it are constantly being patched because uh, as humans and as software developers we make mistakes. So there's going to be problems, there's going to be holes. And in the IT world we've come up with a whole line, a whole way of thinking about patching. And I wanted to talk about that in particular because I don't think it works particularly well for control systems. And it's one of the areas where as control systems experts, we need to start thinking about where we need to take charge of our own destiny and how we need to think about uh, securing our systems in a way that works for control systems. Now, we actually are faced with a real problem here, and I want to make this clear, because all the control systems out there for the last 30 years were really focusing on safety, on reliability, on efficiency, uh, on uh, ease of use. And uh, security wasn't even part of it. You know, I never saw, I worked for a large vendor, I never saw any uh, requirements documents talking about security when I was a young engineer. Um, it wasn't even uh, considered, so it certainly isn't going to be built in. And all the products that we have out there, to, through no fault of uh, the vendor or the user or the designers, are generally not designed to be secure. Now we're going to need to do something about that, and that's the challenge we're faced with. Um, to give you an idea of just like how serious this could be and, and what's happening prior to Stuxnet, when, before people started really looking at control systems, there were a total of uh, five security um, advisories and three in the 10-year period, uh, three um, vendors involved in the 10-year period that the U.S. government's ICS CERT tracked security vulnerabilities in control systems. Right after Stuxnet, it exploded and there were 176 public vulnerabilities, 39 vendors. Um, and I have a little chart you can see there. Um, these vulnerabilities started to become very, very pub, uh, public. This chart came from a, a program called S4, a public event in the US where the researchers who found the vulnerabilities uh, put them out in public explaining exactly how you can attack these particular vendors, where the weaknesses were, and they actually supplied the code to do those attacks as part of that conference. It increased again in uh, 2012, 2013 uh, dropped a little bit. Um, this year I think it's going to rise again. Um, but the scary part to me is that 40% of the vulnerabilities that are currently getting published are getting published with working attack code included. Now in the IT world we've got a fairly established process about how we deal with vulnerabilities. And if we think about that it's um, we get informed that we have a vulnerability and so we want to go patch it or we scan our network um, and then we go out and patch. That's pretty straightforward and I get that every week when my uh, desktop computer reboots because Microsoft has put out a patch that our IT department has then pushed out to me. So we're getting pretty well constant reboot cycles. Um, or scanning. Scanning is a very common technique to look for uh, vulnerabilities. But it doesn't work so good in the, uh, in the control system world. Give you an example, a few years ago, uh, an EU gas utility hired a consultant to come in and do scans on their network. Now that uh, consultant uh, accidentally ended up venturing under the SCADA network. His penetration tool uh, locked up that SCADA network. 
and that company uh, was unable to ship gas for four hours. So the whole idea of scanning a control system is probably a bad idea. Then there's the whole question of patching. Again, I mentioned, and we're all familiar with the fact that our computer reboots every Tuesday because Microsoft sent me some patches. Um, the number of patches is amazing. For example, Adobe Reader, um, in the past four years, they've released 33 patches, all requiring reboots. Now, that's one product, Adobe Reader. Um, and the, the number of patches are just unacceptable for a control system. So I started to get very interested in how many patches a control system really would need. If one product needs 33 patches, that's a pretty well a patch every month. How many patches does a, a full control system? So I, studied a, I got the opportunity to study the process control network in a large US refinery in 2008. Um, we found 85 computers on the network. We were able to get good data on uh, 78 of them. Uh, we were able to then map all the processes that were running on those computers. And um, since many computers had the same processes running, or, you know, there were redundant computers, et cetera, we found 272 processes available for running on those computers. We then took those and we went and looked in the National Vulnerability Database and found which ones had vulnerabilities registered. And it turned out, of the processes out on that plant floor, uh, there were 48 with registered vulnerabilities. So then we decided to look and see, well, okay, what does that translate to? Have they been patched? Nope, they hadn't been patched. Uh, there were over 5,000 open vulnerabilities on that plant floor, in that control system, running when we were visiting. So a lot of them were in the operating system, so there was a massive cleanup of the operating system. Uh, that got rid of half of them. But then it occurred to us, wait a second, there's a lot of vulnerabilities listed in the National Vulnerability Database, but it was all for things like Adobe or uh, McAfee or um, Windows components. There wasn't a single listing for the control system components, the ICS components in there. Does that mean that those ICS components were perfect and there were no vulnerabilities? I doubt that. So we started a different tack to try and figure out what had we missed. If they weren't listed in the National Vulnerability Database, were there still hidden vulnerabilities sitting inside those control systems? So we used a technique called looking at the uh, uh, clock or kilo lines of code. We went into each of the processes and we determined how many lines of code we estimated. Now there's some fairly good analysis and statistics that show the vulnerabilities sh show up at a pretty regular rate for every thousand lines of code. Uh, if you look at, for example, Windows XP or any Windows products or Linux or uh, all the products out there in the market, you can get good statistics. We picked a fairly conservative number of 0.03%. So for, uh, point, uh, for every thousand lines of code, you get 0.03% uh, are the number of vulnerabilities. Okay, so looking at the number of lines of code on that plant floor, that estimated there were nearly 1,800 vulnerabilities that were sitting ready and waiting to be exploited someday on that plant floor. That's a lot of patching. Now, I just don't think it's practical to do that patching for a number of reasons. First of all, patches cause problems. We're, we're all reluctant as controls engineers, as professionals, to just go and patch. When I see a patch coming in for my iPhone, for example, as much as I trust it, I'm not going to do it at a conference like this because I'm not sure that it's going to work. I'm going to wait till I get home. And in fact, there's some good statistics and good analysis that were, uh, at a paper that was called uh, by uh, Zoning uh, Yin uh, that were presented a few years ago. Excellent paper if you want to read it. Um, and he showed that um, when they look back at the patches that were available on operating systems, um, up to a quarter of those patches uh, were incorrect um, and had impacts to the end user. In other words, they were bad patches. A quarter of the patches that he found were bad patches. And of those bad patches, 43% had serious consequences like crashes. That's bad. So if people have a resistance to patches, it's for good reasons. So, Pa faulty patches can give us a lot of problems. They can break things that work perfectly well. They cannot resolve the vulnerabilities. Uh, one of the things that I learned from the ICS cert was many of the initial patches supplied to them actually don't fix the problem. 
Um, good, even good patches, ones that are well designed, will require shutdown and restart of your process in most cases. They will remove functionality that you might depend on, or they require special staff skill, a staff of special skills to be present. And this is a serious problem. So even if you get a perfectly good patch that you know works, you have to be very careful. I'll give you an example of this. Um, one of the major oil companies with a lot of platforms uh, in the Gulf of Mexico ran into a problem a few years ago. Uh, they were aware of a patch called um, Microsoft Patch 02039. Uh, it was released in July 2003. This patch was for uh, SQL Server, Microsoft SQL Server. And they started to roll that out. But there was a problem. In order to be able to uh, install that patch, you really had to be a Microsoft expert, particularly if anybody had worked with that patch, you'll know that it could lock up your server. And a server on a platform shouldn't be locked up. So they had to have Microsoft experts go out to the platform. But virtually none of their Microsoft experts were certified for platform uh, access. So they only had about two, and they had um, several hundred platforms they were dealing with. And so they were unable to do the rollout. Um, the, so what happens was that they had only patched about a third of their platforms when Slammer hits six months later and uh, impacts all these servers on their platforms. So sometimes patching is just delayed not because the patch is bad, not because you don't want to do it, but literally manpower uh, concerns impact you. There was a really, really good paper uh, presented a few years ago now um, by AstraZeneca at ISA conference that talked about their experience with patching and control systems. And they developed a very structured mechanism to be able to uh, install patches into a regulated industry, namely the pharmaceutical industry. Um, but the fastest they could patch was 34 days. That was the best they can do. Now, I've talked to other people who have told me um, patch cycles can sometimes take up to 180 days um, in regulated industries by the time you go through all the steps because it is a change. So again, this is a real problem with patches. Now, to be 100% clear, I'm not against patches. Patches are important, but we can't completely depend on them. Um, number of reasons why we can't completely depend on them. Uh, sometimes there is no patch. Um, I worked with a large vendor who discovered uh, in internal testing they had a vulnerability in their system. Uh, unfortunately, the vulnerability was in an embedded operating system supplied by a third party company. And that company uh, refused to make the patches. So the vendor wanted to make the patch. Um, it's a vendor that you guys all use. It's a well-known vendor. Um, but they could not do the patches literally because their supplier wouldn't cooperate. Um, I'll tell you later what uh, they ended up doing to deal with it. But I'll also talk a little bit, I want to talk a little bit right now also about um, our own experience. My company, uh, Tofino Security, and we release a firewall product. And um, in 2010, we released version 1.6. Now, our company policy is, is that if you want an upgrade, you pay for it. Um, or you'll be on, you have to be on a maintenance contract, but otherwise we charge you for it. But in 2006, we released a patch with a lot of new features, but it also um, included security and performance issues. It was a whole upgrade. And instead of charging for it, we made an offer to anybody that if it was free, if you downloaded it within 30 days, you got a fairly valuable upgrade uh, as long as you downloaded it within 30 days. Well, at the end of 30 days, and we contacted every one of our customers and informed them, very few people had bothered to do the download. Even though this is a special offer, it's a free offer, we then repeated the offer for another 30 days. We only got a 30% download rate on our, on our free upgrade. Uh, to, so this really, by the way, that's 30% of them downloaded it because it was free. I don't know whether they actually installed it. So you have a really interesting problem here that um, in our industry, I think quite reasonably, we're very reluctant to be patch happy like we can be on a desktop. Okay, So I don't believe patching will work for the vendors. It's very, very difficult to QA patches fast enough when somebody releases a vulnerable. Or you can run into the no patch possible problem. And for end users, 
There's all the problems with downtime, impact on safety and operations, impact on certifications, uh, what do you do about legacy products, um, manpower limitations. So all of this makes patching one part of the solution, but we really need to avoid that patch treadmill. So my recommendations is that we do this as a, in, in a two-pronged approach. One is, yes, have a patching program, but realize it's not going to be continuous. It's good to patch, but to do it in a very controlled manner. But in the meantime, while you're waiting to be able to do patch, have what I call compensating controls or mitigations. And these, this technique, by the way, is widely used in the telco industry. When Cisco released a patch to somebody like British Telecom, British Telecom doesn't just run out and throw it into their uh, big routers. No, they're going to take um, six, eight, ten months to be able to validate that patch. And, and so during that time, they're going to be putting in compensating controls. So what are some compensating controls? What are the benefits of compensating controls? Well, compensating controls are independent of the product development. Uh, there, there's less potentially less um, impact on product functionality. Uh, they are faster. They're, typically, they're lower customer resistance because a customer can back out a compensating control. What are some typical examples of compensating controls? Well, things like product reconfiguration. Um, last year, there was a, a whole list of PLCs that came out with vulnerable uh, web servers on it. Now, you could either patch the PLC, or you could just turn off the web server service on that PLC. That's a compensating control. Or you could block the HTTP traffic. You could set all your switches and all your firewalls to kill HTTP traffic on your plant floor. If you're not using it, why leave it open? Okay, so that's another compensating control. You could have specific IDS or firewall signatures. Or you could do what we call whitelisting the network where you look uh, at deep into the packets, deep into the protocols, and start to look at exactly what a particular protocol is being used for. <clears throat> very, very similar to what you see in the home market where people start to look at the content of HTTP to protect their children from pornography, we need to do the same thing on the plant floor where we look at, into the content of a Modbus message or the content of an HTTP message and saying, what's the intent? And by doing that, we can really whitelist our network and cut down the amount of messages on the network and therefore reduce the need for patching in a hurry. Um, to make it work, there really is a couple of things that are absolutely critical for patching. Uh, first of all, it has to have any, uh, sorry, patching any, on compensating controls. Any compensating control really has to have a low impact on reliability and safety. Uh, if you have a solution that impacts your safety, it's just not going to be accepted in our industry. And it must be simple. This is absolutely critical. We tend to make security too complicated. And in the words of uh, the ISA 99 security system, we have to make this security something that a plant superintendent or engineer or senior operator can do in their spare time or yet security is going to flop. And I think that really applies to the whole question of mitigating controls. Okay. Now, I'll give you a couple of examples of where I have seen this work very successfully. One is something called a fixed configuration firewall. Um, th these have fixed rule sets to match particular product vulnerabilities. So they're built rule sets designed specifically for the, for the job of cleaning up traffic on the network so a vulnerability can't be exercised. Um, so examples could be you could have a, a firewall that's designed specifically to only allow FTP, Modbus, and say SNMP traps if that's all you need and deny all other protocols and even dig in deeper. Um, there's some real benefits with this. It's trivial to install. It's very simple to QA. I'll give you an example of this. Honeywell produces something called the safety system firewall. Now this little firewall here is designed specifically to protect safety systems. Uh, there's no user configuration. Um, it only allows Modbus commands to go through it, nothing else. So if you have a, a vulnerability that's HTTP, it just blocks all HTTP. But in particular, what it does is it looks at the Modbus messages and it only allows Modbus read messages, and it only allows Modbus read messages that are, what, 
we call sanity checked or uh, uh, meet the specification of the protocol. The whole configuration is completely locked down to the Honeywell safety system. Um, and if new vulnerabilities come out, then a new configuration can be loaded, but nobody has the chance to play with it, make mistakes. It's all pre-tested at the factory. Oops. Uh, another example is one that's put out by Caterpillar. This is for protection of their, uh, of their compressor systems. Now they have remote monitoring services at Caterpillar at solar turbines, uh, specifically designed to be able to monitor um, offshore compressor platforms. Um, now, there, the, as you know, compressor platforms are high-risk systems, um, and monitoring, has, um, even if you're using a VPN or some sort of um, encryption from the remote uh, support office in, you have these risks that what happens if something goes bad at the remote support office? What happens if you have um, rogue insiders or unpatched vulnerabilities in the system? <clears throat> so another example of good compensating controls here was a deep packet inspection firewall that um, Solar Turbines offers that sits behind the VPN on the, on the platform itself. And what it's doing is it's specifically filtering to only allow Ethernet IP messages, because these are Rockwell controllers, and only those messages that are, are safe, proven safe to, for reading. They will not allow writing, will not allow reprogramming, mode changes. Only thing that can be sent through that firewall are messages that are uh, known safe to the controllers. Again, what this is doing is even if a vulnerability occurs or, or is found in the control system, the firewalling acts as a mitigating control. What do I expect to see over the next few years? Well, we've been watching a large program at Boeing over the last few years that I think is really excited, and this is where they're starting to push rule sets out onto uh, their control uh, firewalls, onto their control VPNs that are dynamically changing as the environment changes. This is not something that's generally available, but I think that's where we're gonna go in the future. The ability to control dynamically what traffic you have on your network. So to wrap it up, I believe control systems are hard to patch. I'm not saying, and I wanna be very clear about this, they should not be patched but they cannot be patched continuously like we do today with desktops. So we need compensating controls. We need some mechanism in order to be able to be sure that we can uh, manage the vulnerabilities and not just ignore them. Um, and that's important that we separate security fixes from product fixes, that we find a way of doing this that doesn't require completely reloading our controllers. In order for it to work, a security solution for the whole problem of vulnerabilities is going to have to be simple for the end users to deploy, separate from the control system products uh, QA cycles, provably safe, uh, upgradable in the field, and if things go wrong, some way of backing it out because we all make mistakes. And if we can do this, then we can actually start to manage the vulnerabilities that we're finding on our plant floor. So we've got two minutes for questions. Any questions? I see a question coming over here, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, do remember when you do your questions and answers, if you can state your name, your company, and your question. I'm closing in. I might be quicker. Ladies on top. <laughs> yeah, good morning. My name is Andres Zolotai, and I'm supporting uh, QC and building kind of <coughs> security information systems. Uh, and uh, builds a gap between control systems and, uh, you know, information need uh, which is required by management. Uh, for me, it's always coming a big question. We are all the time patching the system which is not supposed to be patched. Yes. yes. Uh, maybe we can uh, change our behavior and think maybe we need to change the system mm -hmm. on which uh, control system or information systems are running. In this case, 
uh, we will eliminate a lot of problems which you perfectly described in your speech. I, I, I'm sorry, the question is... Uh, yeah, uh, sh shouldn't we uh, begin to think to build and a control, uh, let's say, operation, operating system OS, which will be specifically designed for control systems. So in this case, we will, would not need to do all of these mitigative activities trying to cover the lot right. of holes. I, I mean, I think it would be beautiful if we could build operating systems that don't require patching. I'm not holding my breath for two reasons. One. Um, there are a lot more than just security required in a control system. And we have to can balance all the requirements of performance, of safety, of reliability, of repeatability. Um, oh yeah, and security. So that operating system has got a lot of demands. I think as human beings, it's going to be a while before we make one that's perfect. Uh, maybe we will. And we also have to deal with the fact that we even if we have the perfect operating system and the perfect control system with no vulnerabilities come out in the morning, and we start to install it, it's going to be 20 years before we get rid of all the legacy equipment that we have out there. So I think for the next 20 years, we're going to be faced with a, a challenge. Thank you very much. Uh, we're out of time on the questions. Um, I see hands popping up in the back there, but I, I, I see I'm being, uh, we're wrapping up on this part. So I'll be around. I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions you have uh, during the breaks. Uh, and also there'll be a panel opportunity to ask questions later too. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Eric Byers. Great timing, Eric, and thank you for your question, sir. Do let me remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that these conferences are made successful by your interaction. So Eric, thank you, and thank you for your question, sir. Hosted and organized by Equate Petrochemical Company in partnership with KPC.